She's going to show. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Abana Busia, and I'm the I'm very proud to be the curator of the Lifelines Poetry of Human Rights series. But before I talk about that, I'm even more proud to introduce Where are you? Can you where's my mother? Oh, all right. <laughs> it's all right. So she suddenly disappeared from my I, I'd like to introduce our wonderful CEO, director, and inspiration behind this evening, who, um, Mahna Sadkami is a celebrated women's rights activist, the founder of the Women's Learning Partnership, which sponsors these evenings, a lifelong, um, how should I say, a lifelong founder of women's organizations and supporter of women, a lifelong mentor and teacher, and for us here, a lifelong lover of poetry, um, who is the inspiration behind the organization that we represent and specifically behind this evening. And I'd like my class to come and welcome you and say a little bit about the Women's Learning Partnership. Uh, I, I love saying Her Excellency <laughs> Ambassador Avena Lucia. Uh, it's because not so much that uh, she's an ambassador. Oh, I've seen a lot of ambassadors. <laughs> but an ambassador that has been such a magnificent poet, such an inspiring person, <coughs> teacher, and writer. So the combination, and such a feminist to have that combination. And also, she's not just ambassador to Brazil, where she's hosted part of the time by uh, Jacqueline Petengue, one of the foremost feminist leaders globally. But she's ambassador to the entire continent. <laughs> so, so anyway, I just wanted to uh, tell you how it is that, that uh, we do these uh, sessions with these wonderful poets and others uh, of uh, perhaps similar excellence uh, every year. Uh, some of it came from my own personal experience teaching in Iran um, many years ago. I was a teenage professor. <laughs> very, very but at any rate, uh, what I learned during my teaching in English literature at the uh, National University of Iran was that once you took the poetry, the English poetry that I had studied and taught in, in America, once you took it to another context, especially a context which is very much uh, poetry oriented, where poetry is a part of the life and DNA of people, that uh, it brings inspiration in the sense of all the things that we as people and as women aspire to. You know, when people saw, young people saw uh, ideas and ways of life which were different but possibly more liberating for them, they wanted it all. But they didn't want it just so exactly packaged and sent to them, even in the form of a poem or a novel. They wanted to take the idea and, and somehow think of it in terms of their own narrative style, their own story, their own past heroines. So from there, actually, the way that I saw how common aspirations are contextualized and seen in a light that is the same but different. And that was something that has inspired our, our work in uh, a women's learning partnership. That is, we are 20 partners from across the world who work together, we get together twice a year, but talk to each other almost daily with the difference of hours and whatever, it's not easy. I can be technology aside, it's not easy. But we actually uh, design our programs together 
but you contextualize them in 20 languages back home. And when you think that the United Nations has five languages, you got to give some of these people <laughs> the credit for a small organization to have that. But in any case, the, the, the um, organizations are, of course, doing a leadership training in inclusion, um, the, the uh, human rights, but the essence of our work is communication, and communication also very much involves literature, the arts, and the history of the peoples with whom we, we have the privilege of, of working. So I want to thank Arena, who's come all the way from that very important post to bring us these fantastic poets who are going to really inspire you, I'm sure, and, and it's such a privilege to hear them all. And thank you all for being here. It's not easy getting around in this town, and I don't know why uh, we have been uh, putting different spots that we have some difficulty finding, but thank you for being here. I know you love it, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, yes. It's the nature of poetry readings. You never know who's going to show up or how many people will show up. And, you know, sometimes you have people sitting in the aisles and other times you don't, but we're glad you're here. And we are very proud of Lifelines, especially when we do it here at the CSW, because we are a Lifeline. We are the only humanities event to be an entire thing. I mean, we are here because we're all advocates and, you know, policy makers and workers for women's rights and we do what we need to do and this is an important space to do it. But we are, we are very conscious of the fact that there's nowhere else that anybody offers on a regular basis a different way of remembering our humanity and the way we do our work. And so, briefly about lifelines, what we try to do. This is the literature of human rights. And poetry is so fundamental to us as human beings, poetry and the arts. And what we do every year is to bring our words into conversation with what is happening here at CSW. And every year we do it differently. Each year we have a different group of poets. Except for me. I'm here every year. <laughs> and it is such a privilege to be invited to the board of an organization like the Women's Learning Partnership. And the only thing they want me to do is to curate poetry readings. <laughs> of course I will come. <laughs> and each year though we try but we do things slightly differently. Like the first time I did this, we were celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and so we organized ourselves around clauses of the Declaration. So each year we have a different idea. This year, I confess, I was greatly inspired by this book. You have got some of the pages of this book circulating because Susanna will talk about what it's about. But um, we felt it was important for you to see the visuality of the work. Reda we, are, we are now so used to redactions these days. But I was inspired by the notion of language, unspeakable language, prohibited language, disguised language that is behind the publication of Susanna's book, that that became the organizing principle. How to think of the tension between erasure and presence. And what are the different moments that erasure and presence are read differently. Every year we organize our work so that our poems are in conversation around themes. So this year, we do have four, I'll introduce them, but they're basically beginning with what kinds of times are these. And I mention that because very often we have poems that 
uh, dealing with that go back in time that deal with history. This year, all our poems deal with a very immediate present. There is no rupture between the past and the present as we know, but the themes, the subjects are very, very immediate this year. And so what we do is read in clusters. I will introduce the theme, then we will each read in different orders because our, we pick up on our poems in different ways. Then I'll introduce the next theme. And we will do that. So before we start, of course, I just want to, you've got who the poets are, so I won't spend much time. And it's pretty, your names are there. So I am Abinabusia, in real life a poet and a teacher. I've been a professor at Rutgers for almost 40 years before my appointment in the departments of English and Women's and Gender Studies. And um, I'm reading, I'm introducing us in alphabetical order around the order in which we're sitting. Susanna Case, <laughs> is a professor, program coordinator in the New York Institute of Technology, and her latest book, Erasure Syria, was published last year, and um, as I said, became the ground of this year's reading. One of the things that is very special to me is this has now been going on long enough for me to have a backlog of people who have done this before. But Susanna is new. Um, it's the first time she's reading. I was introduced to her by our veteran of us, sitting beside her, Elizabeth Lara, who read in 2016, um, and wrote and said, God, I've got to talk to this woman. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, but, well, I said alphabetical, but I don't just like Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth is a poet and a language teacher and editor, and obviously a great mentor, who read for us in 2016. Robert Gibbons is, um, received his MFA from City College. His proud boast, if you look at his own website, is that he's a Brooklynite. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be his nature of identity. He's an award-winning poet and a, a proud student of Michel Baladan, who did teach him. And Michel is the director of the MFA program in creative writing again at, at CUNY. So that's who we are. And we will begin now with the first section, what kinds of times are these? And in this section, usually we, we all read our own poems. We only read our own poems. I've left my behind. This. this year, I am not reading one of my poems first. I'm reading a poem by Adrian Rich. Now, I'm reading a poem by Adrian Rich because before we found Susanna's work, Elizabeth Lara had written an erasure poem after Adrian Rich's What Kinds of Times Are These? And the question was so profound, it became the organizing principle for this first section. So I am going to read Adrian Rich's What Kinds of Times Are These? And Laura will then read her poem, Times Like These. And for you to get a sense of what she's done, it'll be obvious, she'll be echoing the... So what I'm saying, my voice becomes the redacted and raised voice. Her voice will remain. What kinds of times are these? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows, near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappear into those shadows. I've walked there, picking mushrooms at the edge of dread. But don't be fooled, this isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else, but here. Our country, moving closer to its own truth and 
its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost written crossroads, leaf mold paradise. I know already who wants to set by it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is. So why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. Um, so, as Abhina said, my poem is based on the Adrian Rich program, a, a poem, and it's titled Just Times Like These. Between the revolutionary shadows, the persecuted disappear. This is our country making people disappear. The place is ghost ridden. Why? So, I won't tell you anything, because in times like these, you talk about trees. At times like this, the world is in continuous war, and the handout which I you got uh, and I referred to are excerpts from my recent project, Erasure Syria, which is a series of erasure poems and art from newspaper coverage of the war in Syria. And in, as in any erasure poem, words were subtracted from 52 consecutive days of news coverage after the bombing of Syria in April of 2017, until I felt that I thought that what was left was a poem. And what these are meant to do is reflect the larger subject of how war is talked about and what its impacts are. So this, this is three days worth. Day four. A lonely voice was inevitable. It would end with tears, violence with too many unknowns. Day eight. Mother Arsenal, authorize my casualty. Call in the inhuman. Day 12. He doesn't know if the boy survived. So I teach at the City College. I, it's a lovely introduction is that I teach poetry at CUNY, but CUNY is fast. And I actually teach um, at the City College of New York, which is part of CUNY. And if you're from New York, you know that we've been suffering through some austerity measures. And our students are suffering, they're cutting back. So uh, all the writers in CUNY a few years ago gathered downtown, and we had a uh, literally reading and that, that's the title of this poem called CUNY Writers Against Austerity. And uh, the, the, in the first line, I, I mentioned Nana Masconcelos, and for those who um, don't know who he is, he's an amazing Brazilian percussionist, but he's also a friend. I used to make films, and he um, I produced a Brazilian film, and he played the percussion, created the music for the film. The death of Nana Vasconcelos and the silence of his beaten bow and drums is connected to the increase in class sizes 
and cuts to adjuncts. To my Portuguese but dango but cameo attacking a Pekingese is connected to seeds turning into cherry blossom trees. To karma's cause and effect is connected to a governor who cuts funding for students most in need. To bees dying and glaciers melting is connected to what matters, black lives and the end of violence, to the still and clear minds of meditators who imagine peace is connected to the poaching of elephants, to rainforests, rivers, and oceans, and the murder of Berta Caceres in Honduras is connected to the air you breathe and the air I breathe. To the wars, our tax dollars support is connected to the mantra for the politicians who asked, todos somos mexicanos. To the rights of women and girls is connected to the yoga that opens the heart chakra. To the lead in Flint and Newark schools to the summer, I saw wild horses run on Pismo Beach is connected to the rainmaker who breaks the drought in the village, to the wine and bread we'll share this evening salute, is connected to inter, prefix meaning between, among. We are interconnected our happiness and our suffering, the ancient vines, the white tigers, and this planet we go on. Good evening. I feel very, very privileged to be the only man. <laughs> In 2016, I had a chance to study with Nina Alexander. This poem is for her. Nina said to us, home is always a little bit beyond reach, a place both real and imagined, longed for, yet marked perpetually as an elsewhere, brightly lit vanishing. What now, my love, now that you left me, how can I leave to another day? Watching my dreams turn into ashes and my hopes into bits of clay. What now, my love? Now that you're gone, I'll be a fool to go on and on. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. If I must live or die, my tar beach feet shipped after a visit to Tacoma Canyon, summer 2016, Brown Pelican. In California, I walked into a puddle of tar. The physicians rubbed my feet in baby oil. The tar began to chip away, lost to reliquary. Lost to elegy, the environmentalists had to rescue animals from the Pacific, had to wash their tar-covered bodies with dish detergent, had to wash my feet, pieces of me chipped away like the new crucifix, covered by man-made, by heat and concrete, skyscrapers and tapers of building the 900 million remain hidden in the kitchen of the earth. They do not come up for air. Their lair beneath ocean, beneath lake, beneath glaciations. A drunken boat gloats. 
The air becomes crescendo when the levees broke a Mississippi goddamn. Crams of fisheries and hatcheries, a menagerie of animals without territory, without cartographer. I will pray for those who have no control over the body. Mm. Times of times of these indeed. There are times when we are all in movement, when people leave home, when we have border crossings, when we negotiate wars. <coughs> That's what we deal with in this section. The reality of human movement. What makes us leave, what happens to us when we cross, how do we feel when we get there, how do we adjust, and what indeed are the people we join up to when we find them. Uh, our family lived in the Middle East um, in the 1990s, and we were fortunate enough to go to Syria and uh, Damascus, Aleppo, and some other places. Um, and so when the war broke out in Syria, it was, it had a tremendous impact on me. And um, this is why I wrote this poem. It, I wrote it after I saw a photograph on the cover of the New York Times magazine, which I could not take my eyes off of. It's a photo of Aleppo. The photographer is Sebastian Lis, and it was published on May 24th, 2017. The poem is called Aleppo After the Fall. The blue sky does not turn from streets and intersections inhabited by absence, from the crenellated towers that have lost their voices, from houses abandoned by the baking of bread, the shouts of children, Om um Bashir calling her son to come home. The concrete building of Soviet gray have turned to gold in the early morning light. Where sunlight fails, the windows are gone. Over there, an arch still standing, because an architect believed air could hold up a building. Because when a building collapses, the layers cling together, philo, in the service of war, philo of blasted floors. The shopkeepers left in a hurry. Steel gates, barricade, emptiness, anything of value stolen or routed away. In the distance, a fine dust. It could be the desert wanting to cover the city. High above the street, a roof is suspended by rebar strings. The man walking past it does not seem to notice. The dropping of concrete, the dropping of we see him passing through Ahatab Square. Something has beheaded the palm trees. Mm -hmm. Their trunks are scorched. Mm -hmm. Paving stones trace a path through the grass growing wild around them. A riot of yellow flocks. The man wears a black backpack and carries a large white bag. Food? Clothing? Batteries? What can he find in the shell of his city? He has grown used to its unevenness. He collects rainwater to drink. Why leave when it is his home? On a clear night in Aleppo, he can see the stars. And if there is a moon, he can see well enough to avoid whatever is broken. Um. 
the silicone gold herds. The men are unloading goats from a boat onto the sandy beach of Paleogura. A few goats escape, run wild through the port, only to be surrounded, tied up, and carted by a wheelbarrow into town, while a large pelican sits on the beach wall watching. This happens often, both before and after the refugees arrive, half dead from across the Mediterranean, Somali, Sudanese, Egyptian, Syrian, they have mistaken the island for Italy. Herded into a gym, police paint registration numbers on their arms as they sleep. Names are ignored. We are human. We have names that complain. There is so little left. In some parts of the world, even the goats have names. reading two short poems. The Meal. You wonder what it is that makes them pray, regardless of the presence of strangers, to thank what distracted God for this hasty meal prepared in flight eaten cold in alien rooms in foreign lands where not assassins and not friends can find them. With names not their own, wearing clothes not their own, in rooms not their own. They say grace they are not forsaken and mean it. You wonder. Petitions. And we have asked for courage not to belong, not to identify, not to regret not to confine the spaces of our souls to the places of our first heartbeat, not to let withering umbilical cords keep us arched, making more barren the strangeness of our foreign homes. This poem is called Non Sequitur. Even if I know why the mind which begins a thought and rarely finishes the drive from Brooklyn takes two and a half hours to Glen Spey in autumn to see temple, trees, and golden Buddhas meditating on equipoise, the mind is still an absorbed. It is impossible to cook the perfect ratatouille, eggplants, courgettes, and peppers sprinkled with conversation. We never listened to each other in my family, but shouted over the wind and rain, the trees bent to see winter in the years of the wars, Iraq, Darfur, and the Times front page photo of the dead in the desert of my childhood, near the sea of my childhood, I learned to whisper to be heard, the art of invisibility for a shy girl is easy in Kuwait. Speak when spoken to, the truth is what they killed, Anna Politkovskaya, 
four in Russia. 48 hours before you return and the refrigerator is empty. Milk and rice grown in patties. A woman in jeweled saris pick tea from the side of a mountain in Nepal. Kathmandu's market is where I buy a small blue tanga, roll it up, and carry it to Harlem on the two train each day, thinking about ellipses and semicolons. On 125th Street, you can see the Hudson River. And remember that we live on an island. Palm trees and sandpipers and the ocean is what we wake to. Mornings full of dreams and grammar. A non sequitur in a broken world of our own making. It was 86th Street five years ago. I rushed down into a pit after leaving some of my possessions on the seat. The world went underground. The world I thought I knew, not a divided one, not a world that collided with this impossibility. My attention may have been drawn to the art of Kandinsky or the Constant graffiti that's in my head. They always overcrowd me in this crowded church. The anti-Semite, the Nazi sympathizer, the late night cruiser. Even if you are a dancer, perchance you may have chant to the wall or fall down from intoxication. It was 86th Street, five years ago near Lex, where I dropped a small mirror purse full of cash and credit cards. And I said, oh my God. I'm done. This is New York. You just don't do this here in this city of petty cash. I punish myself with anxiety. I cry in more charity and sobriety. If I were drunk, maybe I would be more careful when this city is so full of labels. In the back of my head, I knew it would never return. I had been burned, said to myself it was a late night stop hanger. They would cross it, look inside, toss it, and I would be dead upon arrival. Said they would open my privacy, for now I would distrust the government, would still believe in a failed humanity, would I believe in this long process of renewal, but for now my wallet was missing. It was like searching for missing jewels. The drone behind the glass would have no compassion. It was a story that had been heard for year after year, midnight after midnight. It was not sensational or romantic enough. It was too jade or just too downright trite. A part of a harassing voice answered, drop your wallet, sir. Ah! <laughs> Would have preferred you to say, you need an update on your card, but I drop my wallet. I know there is a combination of protocols, a nursery of questions or even laughter about it behind her famed sophistication. Sir, you drop your wallet, just call it taken, she thought. And she would not say it was night, but it was a day revelation to her. Call it a shakedown. Call it missing like the 3,000 children living in the subway system in D.C. or Chicago or Detroit or Miami. This is a big system. There is a rhythm by which we do things. My wallet was one of them, a toddler, like a Romanian woman that held her baby tight that night and asked me for money. My wallet, I would fold her and place her in a particular place of order every day. If she was female, I would call her Bridget. If she was male, I would call him Charlie. What a way to end the day. My wallet was missing. The grief was in every step, each chance encounter. Sir, are you listening? Your wallet is missing. If you dare to believe, there's a lost and found on 34th Street. <laughs> but this was 86. Not 34. Stop and kiss me now. 
Tell them you drop your wallet and they will take you through this process. It will take three years to go through grief and loss, another additional to receive assurance that there is no inkling of identity self. Tell them you, that you are American or Armenian. Tell them that you are Jewish or Hebrew, sir. Do you understand They are that you are missing in this city? You are invisible on this island. Invisibility is an unacceptable thing. So we fight it. We take a stand. In different ways. This one was one of mine. It brings together two things. First of all, I am a woman of faith. I grew up in a very Methodist household, where the thing about Methodism was its humility. We had the best hymns. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, in times of grief and in times of joy, it's a hymn that comes to me. And very often that hymn is an answer to but sometimes it just poses questions. One of those was after 9-11. We sang in, in, in Ghana, the service, I was in Ghana when 9-11 happened and we had a memorial service where ironically, the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps in Ghana in September 2001, was the Palestinian ambassador. So it was the Palestinian ambassador who led the service to honor the Americans and all those who were fallen. We sung at that service a really beautiful hymn, which I'm going to sing part of it too. But what troubled me, that hymn haunted me every time I thought of 9-11, and then we had to deal with the American response to 9-11, which to those of us from other parts of the world who knew the devastation sometimes that Americanism, if you like, had caused, the response was troubling. Not the public response of human compassion, but the governmental political response of what to do with that rage and grief. Now the laborer's task is over. Now the battle day is past. Now upon the farther shore lands the voyager at last. Father, in thy gracious keeping. Leave we now thy servant sleeping. How? To justify the unquiet death of so many thousands Father, we'll quarry the flesh of hundreds of fathers in Kabul and Kandahar for every flaming and fallen 
out of your in thy and for each shard of every shattered pane of glass will shell the thousands of innocents huddling in the bomb shelters of Basra. Gracious keeping, and though Ben Laden doesn't even live in Babylon, we now for every fragmented body part in people, we will scatter shockwaves of smart and awesome bombs on the five million invisible humans haunting the streets of Baghdad. Thy servants sleeping. I was so taken with that, I almost put out to get up. <laughs> <laughs> Here's three more days from Horatio, Syria. Day 17. Slaughter, stoking shockwaves. Scorched earth, mistakes. We let things go too long. Day 21. We are very concerned, deeply concerned. We have expressed these concerns. It was less than an hour's notice before the strikes. Day 30. Clear the dust, yellow mist. Children have become birds in heaven. Death dreaming about a small boy. Avana asked me to pair uh, the two poems you're going to hear now, and after hearing her poem, I understand why. <laughs> they extend what she was saying. We public. We public on fire. I refuse this night, this desert, so sand, so sun, so cadavering fire. Their retread stops, their tired hummer roll stops. Planes fly over, over, stop. Over, over, stop. Some lie, some lie dead. I rehearse, I cry out, can choose, can choose. Sand needles fly, I'll bleed, retreat. They're so charred flesh, re-pulse. Pulse, stop, their blood, no pulse. Over, over. Stop. I refuse to fire weapons amass destruction. And the next poem is called Ponce. It's actually a form called the Ponce. If war blows through your life, take in your hands the weapons abandoned in the killing fields, hammer them into belts. <laughs> this poem is for Teresa Patricia Okomo. It's entitled Statue. She climbed atop of the Statue of Liberty to protest injustice. The bust of a nude Amazon woman, fingernails chipped like razor wires. She is a fire alarm, 
born of the Congo, a mom's egg, led from Staten Island with placard and tape, made in a ballad of tragedy, maddened by this future, fussy over her children, for she is in a domain as plain as liberty, not a cotillion adorned white, but milk and breast and test as she scales the body. Her reckless and naughty way she rock climbs, finds it a thrill until she becomes a threat, for she knows migration as an abolitionist geography. First, it's the base. Her tongue becomes mace if you refute her, if you exclude her, if you disturb this peace, the incitement will increase as the body as the crowd looks up. But it's a bust and a beat down until she turns around. The sound is of a trance, as if she takes this stand on a man's soapbox, carrying a placard as she tried to reach the mansard roof of her mouth and when she screams and flails, the tuft of her hair becomes bales of cotton. All the world weighs on her shoulder, but liberty contains mold, a sort of seepool, a, a sort of cesspool green in patina as the police takes her. They pull at her seams or the hems of her dress she is no less vital than Alice Paul or Fanny Pinkhurst, a purse of insurrection without protection clause. She is no less than Mary or Shirley or Hillary or Lilith. She wants to reach the pillbox hat, the crown, the founding of the nation. She cries creation, a nation of mourning, turns her head for the people, for it's green, not blue, inward woman. I think at times like this, it's very hard to watch the news, the hearings, the, the trials, and um, I think not just for poets, but for all of us. But sometimes we have to. Sometimes we have to bear with us. And I wrote this poem after I turned on the news and made myself watch those 140 young journalists um, protesting. Um, and this year this poem was published and I realized it's really for all of us who are suffering, women, children, and men. And it's called We Hear You. The wind heard your story. The oak and the bay heard your cries. The white fox and brown hawk heard your story. The raccoons and red deer hear your testimony. The gecko and sparrow, sparrows were listening. The mountains heard you. The red rock canyons and the roadrunner hear you. The coyote and whales hear you. The rivers and moon hear your story. The volcanoes and the moose hear you. The creeks and lakes hear you. The dogs and the crows hear you. The seagulls and the crabs listen. In the village, towns and cities in the countryside, people hear you. The homeless under the bridges hear you. The old people hear you. The seers and oracles predict your victory. Mm -hmm. The sun hears you and the wildfires and hurricane winds hear you. Chief Orin Lyon says, we will know the end is near when the wings rise and the children are mistreated. We hear you on televisions and computers. We hear you in our dreams and in our protest songs during the marches. Our daughters who stand up one by one for justice, for girls and women, our daughters who cry and speak the truth, we hear you. Our daughters in refugee camps, in detention centers, in prisons and cultures that deny them rights. Yes, 
we hear you too. It is late in the short history of the planet for justice, but we hear you. We know the earth is female. She cries, gives birth, gives life, gives us food and water. She hears you. Truth is a song and a testimony. Truth is witness and empty. We listen and hear your truth. We breathe and your truth is the air of the kindness transforming the living. I realize we've now reached the last section, and I realize I did not take account of the fact that actually this year they've given us 15 minutes longer than they usually <laughs> <laughs> So, here's what we're going to do we're going to finish our program. Then we will take a few minutes for QA because we have time for once. And then our poets are each going to choose one last poem. And at the end of the QA, we will all read, we will offer, we will give an offer of a poem in reverse alphabetical order. So we'll give a shout at the end of the QA. Um, so that's what we'll do to enjoy the time that we have, which we really do. Because this last section, we called it the balancing of words. Because we were thinking of ourselves as poets and cultural workers. But Sometimes it's the inadequacy of words. Sometimes the words are too many and you need silence. Sometimes the words are too few. Sometimes there are other ways of speaking and we try to materialize them. But words in the end, what we do with our body, touch, the feel, language, and how do we find that language? Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. I've been incorporating blues lyrics in my work and his last piece. Here's a blues lyric from the Everglades of Florida. Don't let the day rise. Don't let the day rise. Don't let the day arrive. Don't let the day arrive. And don't let me walk. Don't let the day hold The title of my piece is On the Ocean. I heard the story of a man named John. He wanted to proselytize on a restricted island off the coast of the Indian Ocean. And the people were called the Sentinelese a 55,000-year-old civilization that refused to conform. They were not willing to modernize, not willing to gentrify into a world that is as fast, as long as it will last. The people, the Sentinelese, considered tribal or primitive, or any of those textbook phrases are not inhibited, are not limited to our idea of society. And what is wrong with keeping your person close. They will not be coerced 
to innovate, not the will of the people to invite a resort, a casino, a development, a cohort of islands with miniature golf courts to live beneath the radar without car or airplane, without chaos or the insane, not the paved roads of our continents, not the blasphemous loads of steel or machinery, the city needs. Their animistic bodies are marvels for the curious, for the purity of Christendom, an art object for the museum cabinet, maybe a display for the zoo, a crew of elephants domesticated, appropriated with social or economic or political non-status seekers, cultural phonics, and his name was John. And he made a boat to traverse the mighty waters of the, the, the restricted areas of our histories, the Nicobar, the Andaman, the Indian, all the names we call and try to pay them, try to pray for them, try to anoint them in this new world, in this old world, with travel by canoe, with Bible in his hand, a man of land and country, of privilege, of means, in between this heaven we call hell, this Dante's purgatory, his Christian missionary self, came to tell them about Jesus, about the crucifix, and if we did not know Columbus in our thoughts, bought and sold small parts, and if we did not know Santa Maria Nina and the Pinta did not arrive, the America that's beauty in him, with all the self-regard for nation, John the Conqueror, John of the Cross, and met them the seven leaves of people, a warrior, a sect, a tribe, an animist, a blame for the conspiracy, for the privacy to tell them about God, far from their island, a God that is a star in this myriad planet, in this pantheon of polygons and polytheism, a mob of them with bow and arrow, call them Roque or Cold Mother, call them devastation or destruction. John the Conqueror, his Bible shot him back to the ocean, back to the baptism of Pocahontas, shot him back to the crucified, like Calvary, a bloodbath in communion, a bloodbath at indigenous, a dragging, a hanging, an insurrection beyond border, beyond the state of the union, a mutiny like Amistad. His body became a breach, a reach beyond latitude. His body became a shipwreck. The Titanic plates will implode, and the land will belong to the Wanda. Will glaciate, will ice over in the kingdom come. Will rain murder and trial and tribulation. Will be 40 days of Noah on the rain tide. When the ocean becomes ocean, and the land becomes ocean, oh ocean, oh ocean, oh flood your gates, making me motherless, great fertilizer, great murderer. My body will become de composition great murderer, auction me into that great beyond, transpose me back like plankton, like amoeba, like a keel. And then John saw a number that no man could see over. His body became the great revelator. Oh, the ocean is mother, and she is mother ocean, her chorus landscape, the way she makes life and death, the way her breath suffocates, and the consul of one his body back. But he has taken his life in elegy, his body is baptized. Oh, ocean, your liquid grave, the waves are so contentious, the moon and tide will roll back to God, oh, ocean, in the photosynthesis to mention when my body becomes an ecosystem. Now my Philistine, as caverns of my body becomes pure sunshine, pure pine needle, stymied energy pent up in me, oh, ocean, the part of me that is pure water, pure whisper, pure ruby's water wheel, my projected landscape, I can be so shallow, oh ocean. <laughs> Still handsome at 64 and sporting a boutonniere. 
My father stands at attention, hands clasped behind his back. We don't yet know he will live only two more years. My mother looks to the right. She is elegant in navy, wears an orchid pinned to her dress. In the late afternoon sunlight, the eaves and iron railings cast shadows at precise angles, and behind them, reflected in the storm door glass, the bare sycamores tell me the photo was snapped in early spring. Forty years later, I copy it onto my computer, zoom it to life size, where their features dissolve into pixels. And when I reverse the zoom, they become pure light. Their voices come to me. They step off the screen, and I rush into their arms and hold them one more time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> such a funny expression of love. <coughs> I was going to do a different poem of the first man, and then I decided I'm doing one for Daniel's photograph. <coughs> I have a series of poems about other art forms. A memorial for a friend who was an architect. A poem I wrote as a preface to an art book of contemporary Ghanaian women painters. I have the privilege of going through life with one of those things called a best friend. We met at 15 and we have been friends for over 50 years. We both married late. My marriage didn't survive, hers has. She's a mathematician. <coughs> she married a photographer. <laughs> this is the poem I wrote for the wedding. Daniel's photographs. Sunlight on water is hard to render. To learn to catch unseeable light that makes all things visible. To hold translucent <coughs> waters that makes all things mutable. Tension is a held <coughs> breath. If we face each other, hold and pull, we split apart. If we face each other, hold and push, we crack. Unless we elect to arrest the motion Click. at the sublime point of beautiful balance, like all his portraits of you. Mm -hmm. My friends, you have the hearts of dancers who have learned together to hold stillness. When one flows out like a river, the other becomes the banks. And one arches like a rainbow when the other turns to rain. If one of you at heart is a swallow, the other is a nesting tree. And who of you ever is rich is simply a gift of the light. Through that dazzling choreography of living, like a calculus beyond arithmetic, which only time and compassion has taught, you each learn the lover is always the giver, and love the only gift. Captured together like quicksilver, a chemistry constantly bound, always in motion. You are arrested, foamy rays in beams of light, reminding us always 
of still points of our changing world where love abides. Just in case you don't. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank my friends and other you know, gorgeous poets that have been there so fine. And I want to thank you and give you a big hand because without you, um, the poems just would be filling and deep. So thank you so much for taking the time out of the busy lives to come. Um, I've now chosen another poem <laughs> to read uh, instead of the one you know, we picked. And this one is called, The World We Choose, The World We Love. Pears ripen, the turtle crosses a walking path to its nesting ground. My dog attacks her shadow. Lily pads cover the lake, rise from muck of fallen trees and storm. Debris, green algae, thick on the pond, early summer and the air. In San Miguel de Allende, my girl is sick with cancer. The wall built between Tijuana and San Diego extends into the Pacific. Deported mothers kept from babies, separated by finger-thick slats. Use fingers, kissing fingers, tiquero mucho, tiestrano. A sparrow as a dirt bag, and the bottle brush buckeye blossoms stand upright. Drill surgeons instructing the clouds and sun. Monarch. Monarchs appear among white and yellow butterflies in the rain garden. A praying mantis wavers on a blade of grass. The cornelian cherry drops, blossoms in small palms, branches rustle in the wind, remind us of heaven we stopped believing, yet our burning world in your thin arms is the same one who chose loving. Here's three more. Here's three more from Horatius Syria, page 40. A large number of executions. The roof of the building suspected to be a crematory was free of snow. Day 42. The crime against humanity of extermination, the scent of something like burning hair. Day 47. Car bomb blast, separate explosion, last explosion, car bomb blast, car explosion, last conflict enters its seventh year. When I saw the poems you've chosen, and that page is not the last page in the book, but it was the last page that she chose, and as you've heard, she read her pieces in chronological order. I thought it was appropriate for us to end with the accomplishment and this. It's seven. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's so good. <laughs> um, that's why we're here. Because we have to find a way that there will be no more years. That we have
from the end as human beings. What we have found, what we maintain, is the compassion that sees us through accepting us. And yet, who we are is we will take a few. It's a luxury, I think it's the first time we've <laughs> had a chance to do a few and a. Um, we'll take a few minutes and then we will have one last round of review. Because they've been frustrated. If you have any questions. If you don't, of course, we won't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is such an extraordinary experience after all these years that you've been just in front of you. Such an extraordinary experience to have chosen this way of presenting the poems. It reminds me of, of a symphony. It, it's so musical in, in its composition. Uh, if you have uh, how did you come to all of you to this, this uh, decision? Well, for me, the most important thing is to deal with them the day before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, compositions, but I call myself, I say I curate this. You know, we can't talk about it all. But what I do, you know, the first thing was obvious, like we met and we chose the clauses. Otherwise, what I do is I have an idea, or ask them, do you have an idea? And we share that idea. And then I say, send me your poems if you can. Some people do, some people <laughs> don't. <laughs> but I work with what I've got. And I start putting them in conversation and drawing out themes. And then we meet. And so when we meet, I have a rough draft. I have the themes, you know, maybe like these two poems belong here, but we are missing two. And we discuss this works, this doesn't. They were extremely kind this year, they liked everything. They said, no, yeah, this poem will go there, this one will go there, and the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, that I, so so I like, I don't always know all the poems, but I know a lot of them enough to make sense when we have the conversation, you know, for, for, for us to be able to see and share and, and articulate and, and dialogue and pull the themes, the juxtapositions out. I mean, one thing we know is why we're doing this. And so there's a kind of, um, if you like, bedrock of concern and acting. At least that's my perspective. I don't know if you want to, but that's 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 what makes it exciting for me. And I have to say, I said this to them yesterday. This is very good for my soul. It's such a humbling experience. It really is to have these poems and you think, oh yes, you know, or oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. Oh Wow, I've always wanted somebody to say that for me. I go through so many different emotions, and also I appreciate the trust. You know, it's not a small thing that, because us poets, we're used to doing our own thing, I'm reading this, what I'm going to do, and then for somebody to say, no, nah, you know what, you, you, you've got to do that one, but this one is that one. <laughs> um, but I, I do appreciate the trust that they, 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 they give, you know, to, to let me say, let's try this. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just add that um, it was the first time last year when I joined the meeting. And it was an extraordinary reading. I, get, I read in a lot of different situations, but that reading was so extraordinary because you did these two things. One is that it was a conversation between poets. We got to read our own work, but we, it was deep listening. We had to really listen to each other. And then the second was, it's 
we live in extraordinary times, and it's so nice to be to have the opportunity to dedicate our work towards human rights, women's rights, towards peace. Like for me, it was just thrilling, and I I was determined no matter what. Even, even if I'm teaching that day, I just drag the class along because I really feel that. Anytime I can do that in my life, and particularly with such a wonderful group of poets, is so meaningful. Yeah. You know, that's that. That's it, really. And how it comes about is it's, it's serendipity. As I said, Elizabeth actually wrote to me last year about Susanna's work, and so I wrote to her this year, and she didn't initially send poems. She sent a review and one of the ideas of the group came from something that was said about her work in the review and so on, you know, to, to, to make it happen. So it's just, but as, as Michelle says, it's the listening. I try to listen and they listen and we share over a meal. Always. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, you're <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, it's difficult subject matter, you know, to write this kind of material um, and be truthful. It's better for a writer to be writing than not, but it's painful, I think. Um, and I'm wondering. Um, other than bourbon, if anyone would <laughs> share their uh, coping strategy. I probably have said this to someone today, I've probably drunk more in the last 24 months than I had in my entire, <laughs> yeah. entire prior 50 years of alcohol. But, I, I, but aside from that, I mean, um, this has all been, everything that everyone has read has been up to the bone, uh, cuts to the bone. I, I wonder how people cope. I think political poetry is the most difficult poetry to write because um, when you, you do it, you, you really do have to take some of your feelings away. Otherwise, you end up ranting <laughs> about, about something. So um, I don't. I, I don't Right, with <laughs> <That's amazing. Yeah. laughs> After the person, I guess, I'll find you. No, you're right, and then you're <laughs> You do have to be in a, a very centered, well, you have to be in a very centered position to write anything, but you have to be particularly centered, I think, to write political mm -hmm. poems. Yeah, I, I think for me, the it actually, the, the poem is the way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's how I work it through. And then as Super Susanna says, I mean, you really then have to step back and you, know, you can't just sort of just let it go the way it was born. You know, I mean, you really have to, to, to pare it down into something that, that will, will reach other people, you hope. Um, and that is is true to to what you're trying to say. And sometimes I I find feeling very hard. I'm you know I'm thinking of a very early poem of mine. It's not one of my best poems. It's in my first collection, Testaments, but it's the poem I love because I was very hurt. You know, it's a very anti-love poem, really. <laughs> you know? And I did write. I mean, I have the first versions of that one, and it was long. And I was in a lot of pain, and it took me literally years to reduce three pages of this <laughs> rat of photos of this song, angry love letter, to two words. Mm. Accepted. <laughs> the poem wasn't only two words, but at the heart of that, you know, the big thing that it came down to accept it. The moment I could write that, the poem came into play. You know, so you do what you can. Sorry, yes. So, do you want to say something? No. 
Yes. Um, okay. what, oh, I was just, sorry. I was just no, going to no. add because I think it's a great question. Um, so I don't consider myself a political poet, and I will confess that when I write these poems, uh, these poems in particular, I felt I feel that I'm the vehicle. I feel they're written. It's the poem that's coming through me because I am a coward. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take that stand, and I would much rather do all those, you know, drink bourbon, all the other things. <laughs> but and it's what what I said when I said, you know, I, I force myself to, hit, to listen and to watch the news, not all the time, and I, I force myself to bear witness, and then the poem comes. And um, you know, and I think when we, when we, you know, all of us when we're reading it, we all gasp when we. Clap. And we're hearing, you know, something, uh, a main thing that, had, that is sort of passing through us. So as I get older, I'm starting to understand, you know, it's not you. It's not you. You're getting out of the way. You're, yeah. you're letting the poem come through. Yeah. It's what needs to be heard in the world. I, I have to concur with Michelle because I also don't consider myself a political poet. Most of the poems I write are not political, but sometimes it's just if it... it um, the, the situation in the poem invades you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, was just, I, had a, I feel like we are living not just in a political time, but in a time where documentary and nonfiction have this, I think, singular space, and that might just be my background. But um, as I was listening to some of your poems, there is, um, there is a sharpness detail, which I know happens, yeah, that's just good writing, but, um, but they feel very true, and I don't know how much, if there's any reportage that goes into some of these pieces, um, but do you consider your poetry nonfiction? Is it something else? Like, how would you describe, I always think of poetry as the original nonfiction, but that's also, that's just something I think. I think poetry is always something else. <laughs> <laughs> poetry is always something else. Um, one thing I will say is that I do research. In other words, if I if I'm touching on something that has actually happened, mm -hmm. um, I, I I mean I'll let the poem come out and then I'll fix it. <laughs> you know, because I mean I really think it, it's important. You don't want to make a, a boring you know, travel book, but I mean, you, you do want, I, I feel it's important for the poet to, to represent things um, as, as they actually occur and not twist them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is poetic license, but I think that's in a different context. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to concur with that, you know, um, for example, demonic arithmetic. I did go back to that one and made sure that all the places I mentioned were in Afghanistan and Iraq. Because those were, the names were so beautiful, we were going all, I mean, at one point we were like scattered all over the world. You know, so not only did I make sure that the places were in Afghanistan and Iraq, I also made sure that they were not in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> okay, <laughs> for all the reasons that, the complex reasons that we know and understand, so, you know, so it's a slightly different version than the one I, than I, than I, I first wrote because I wanted to make sure I got that point made. I've seen people begin to hover, so I think we need to do our points. Yes, we're doing the first alphabetical rule. So, uh, in the, at the Women's March in 2016, there was a beautiful poster that I fell in love with. And it's described in the poem, and the, the artist is Jessica Sabagal, and she created this poster for the Women's March, and it said on it, which is the title of the poem, Women are perfect. <laughs> Spain. Eleven in jeans and a t-shirt on a burrow. With my family up a mountain train trail, I sway side to side, cling to the reins. 
We stop at noon near a stream. The guide opens a basket of food. My mother walks downstream and I follow. She pulls her shirt off to splash water on her shoulders and face. I turn away, though I've seen my mother in her bra before. But we are outdoors. We are from India. Strangers are near. The sun is hot and bright. She looks at me, reads my mind, buttons her shirt. Never be ashamed of your body, she says. Years later, at the march, I will spot a sign. Women are perfect. In red tight, beneath a young girl's afro, her sepia, her curls luminous on a sepia poster. I remember my mother's words and how they stayed off a culture that preached the reverse. Yes, I'm going to reverse this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is called Crossing. In the distance, sun glare or mirage, a dance without dancers, the desert throbs with beating wings. Across rubble and sand, Past ancient saguaro they run, as faint as the faces they dream under the stars. Fearful of thirst of a snake, of a rat, into the whirlwind, crossing at night, they run so fast they forget their feet. At dusk, a buzzard swoops to the east. They understand their story is written over and over in the sand, stiff crust underfoot. Beneath an agave, her broad leaves, they drain their bottles. In this desert, they find no sheltering oak. What is it that drives them across the Rio Grande? Love or hunger? There may be danger in the weather, but what shakes around them is not the earth. It is the heft of squad cars. This one has the epigraph. From Israel Pound, artists are the descendants of the race. I have justice in my skin, the blind wine of a southern road, veils and railroad porters of yesterday, old mason jars, marble columns, old gold domes of Confederate flags, crags, Dusty tobacco fields. It yields not the fate of the river, the liver of freedom, the Baruntu moon, crows and roosters and hogs, killings and living fat on the spider skillet, millets and grits and wrist meals and wheels of the genesis of mix of spooky midnight. <laughs> so much in America and the implications of purchasing them, and it's called Cayambe Valley Greenhouses. I pray for the workers poisoned by roses 
aldicarb and methyl bromide spray into the soil banned in 13 nations, but not in Ecuador, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides on 400 million flowers shipped to the United States, on women up to their ankles in petals as they sort these deceptive beauties. I give praise for the gargantuan stems that keep the slums at bay, more money earned than from anything except oil and bananas, $2 a dozen here, $30 and more up north. The river is the color of butterscotch. It smells of sulfur, of death, and the devil. The fish float belly up. For this land of deformed limbs, here is the monody. The god of mentally retarded babies lives alongside the god of unending headaches and his two sons, the gods of twitching muscles and blurred vision. I cry for the bedridden, the crazed, their asthma, their broken kidneys, for this perfect place for growing, the volcanic soil, the high elevation, the glory of the blazing equatorial sun. After all, space is what you love best. And so to make it dance in time with light, you built your homes to set space free. Child of earth and air, you made your walls slip out of sight to rest with rocks and sound the sands you shaped, or saw to speak with sage old trees through that flash of love that turns insight to sight and touch. Creation is a gift of time, however short. So your tensile spirit lives in your loving care for details. The design of a corner a kiss, arches framed through a window, a smile, and a splash of unexpected color, a burst of primary laughter through silent, searing pain. You knew proportion, a living skill, and balance, an act of claiming life. Court in camera flash and memory, the art of ethical habitation, your legacy of the way you walked this earth and stood your ground, firm and gentle and upright. Thank you.